elements. So if one changes, you might not change the other, and so on. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say on this. No, I think that's it. That's reason number one. All right, if we have additional attributes associated with it. Or are likely to foresee in the future having additional attributes. In other words, it would be reasonable to say that we would want to store other stuff about a department. All right, it's not crazy, you know. Is there other stuff about the name that we want to store? No, it's our name. But the department, yeah, that, that's, we might want to store more about a department than just the name. Now, you might say, is this an example of redundancy over here? No, it isn't. Because we still have to relate the two entities together. We have to relate the department or the employee to the department to which they belong. <coughs> and again, how do we relate entities together? We relate them together via their primary key. The primary key of one becomes an attribute in the other. So we point to the department by putting the department ID in there. If you think of it this way, that this really is a distinct piece of information than this. All right? This is this employee's department number. This is the department ID for this department. This is the department ID that this person belongs to. And they point together because, again, we want to establish a relationship between those two. All right. So the fact that there could be other pieces of information associated with that is a really good reason for doing it this way instead of that way. Let's play the devil's advocate, though, and say, what if, we, what if there's no chance of having other information about the department? What if I knew 100% there was no chance ever of having other information about the department other than the name. Now, that's a bad assumption, I know, because of course we're going to want to store something more. But let's say there's, there's some other example where we knew that there wouldn't be any additional fields. Then is it okay? Okay. We'll have the department name changes from from business division to uh, business and entrepreneur division. All right, you'd have to go and change it in a bunch of places. That's true. That's a biggie. There's one more issue that we run into, and that's the issue of constraint. All right, if we simply store the department name as part of the employee, then we can't constrain that, all right, to the list of valid departments. So, for example, I could put in employee one, Huffman, is in the business. Business is his department name. Point number two, Zellers, his department name is the business division. And point number three, NORAD, his department is BUS, and so on and so on and so forth, including misspellings, abbreviations, different abbreviations, um, flat out mistakes. All right, in any other way that you want to put it. So, if we have a department name in the employee table, then that's a freeform text field, right? So, we could put in anything that we would want to for the department. All right? Now, that's okay for name, right? Because what are the list of valid names in the world? There is no list of valid names. Whatever your name is, your name is. All right? So you got to enter it in. 
For the department, though, there's a hand, that, you know, there's a certain number of departments here at LC, right? There's, you know, I don't know, maybe 20 departments here at LC, and every employee belongs to one of those 20, all right? So we want to make sure that we constrain the department that an employee belongs to to one of the valid departments. Now, how do you do that? There's some little tricks and access you could do to constrain it and, and all that. That's not a good idea. Wherever you have a chance to build a constraint on the database level, as opposed to the application level, you're better off building it on the database level. All right? Why? Because the database will ensure that that constraint is always in place. So, for example, if I were to do some little trick in access to limit what they can enter in that field, what if someone writes a VB app to access that database? They might not have that little trick in their code to make sure that a valid, um, a valid um, department is entered. What if I develop a website, an ASP.NET website, that accesses that database? The constraint won't be there either. If I build the constraint in the database, then anyone that wants to access that data and manipulate that data has to go through the database to do it. All right? And therefore, that constraint will be enforced. So, instead of letting them put anything in that field, what we're going to do is we're going to define a list of, define a list of valid departments in the department table. And then we're going to set up a foreign key between the department ID here and the department ID there. All right? That foreign key means that if you put in a department ID, it has to be one of the legal values in that table. So if we have 20 departments here at LC, and the department IDs are 1 through 20, you couldn't enter an employee in by, uh, with a department of 50, let's say. You just can't do it. It's not that you can't do it through access or you, you can't do it through VB or you can't you can't do it anyway. Alright? You're blocked completely from being able to enter in something that doesn't match up with the value in the, the department table. One diagram that they often show relating to databases is that applications don't access the database directly, applications go through the DBMS. Now again, it's a little different with access, but to generalize, any application I write doesn't access the data directly. It accesses that through the DBMS. So, any constraint I build in here is going to be in effect for any application that tries to use that data. It doesn't matter if I make a desktop application or a web application or whatever, through the command line, writing instructions. doesn't matter. I'm going through the DBMS. So any constraint implemented here has it covered, no matter how you go at it. If I build a constraint here, all right, then my database is only going to be reliable as the weakest link. Right? In other words, if I try to build constraints here, here, and here, maybe the person that develops this application got it wrong all right, or didn't do it at all. So these applications could be behaving themselves, all right, perfectly, but this one's letting bad data slip in, all right? That's back sort of how it was prior to relational database and prior to being able to relate data together and build constraints. You would have applications that directly access the data. And there was no DBMS as sort of the, the gatekeeper. What's the problem with that? Well, again, 
the reliability of the data in here is only going to be as good as the worst program there. All right. We had an example of this prior to using a relational database on one project I worked on. We did this sort of way, the, the sort of the old school way, because this was this is ages ago. All right. And what we ran into is we had orders without customers and you know, orders for non-valid items, and so on. Why? Well, because one of the programs somewhere had a bug that under certain conditions allowed that to happen. All right? And therefore, maybe this one was perfect, the one I worked on was perfect, the one I worked on was perfect, the one someone else worked on had a bug in it. All right? So, I was doing my job, and I was having good data, but... This program messed things up. Questions about this? This also, in a nice little loop around, this also answers your question about what do I need to do to have an index take effect? All right? The answer being nothing. Because in addition to constraints, the DBMS knows about the indexes or indices. I don't know which is the right word. All right. So I don't have to build any logic in this program, this program, or this program. I simply ask the, the, the database for the data, and it figures out the best way to get it. And it gives it back to me, gives me back the data that I want, in, in, and it retrieves it in the most efficient way. So each, none of these programs need to know about the gory details about what indexes are there and so on and so forth. Because that, this guy's handling it. All right? And this guy will respond to the queries and give the data that the applications need. And it will figure out the best way to get to it. It's kind of like in the old days, you know, and maybe even today, where you have like a reference library, where you're not allowed to walk among the stacks, right? The, the reference librarian has tight control over it. So you go in and you ask for something, all right? You don't have to know what shelf it's on. It could be ordered in any kind of goofy arrangement. But that reference librarian has every single book, knows where it is, and can either look it up or run right to it and bring it to you. You don't have to know those gory details, all right? Because the gatekeeper knows those details. Same idea here. And that's why you don't have to worry about the indexes because everything's going through that DBMS. So, the lesson that we learned from this is, where possible, build the constraints in the database because that will ensure that they get enforced universally. All right? So, why do I have a separate table? I have a separate table so I can create a foreign key and not let, uh, the, not give the ability to, um, not give the ability to uh, just put any old in as, any old thing as a department, but just being able to put in uh, one of the legal departments. Now, when you're designing the database, initially, if you listen, if you think about the problem, a department will almost jump out at you as an entity. All right. In other words, if we were building this from scratch, let's say, and, and I was a person, you were developing the database, and you were asking me questions about what kind of data was in the database, I might say something about, well, we have employee, and employees belong to a department, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Almost everything that I say in that sort of conversation is either going to relate to an entity an attribute, or some kind of relationship. And if you think about it, a department sounds more like an entity than an attribute, right? I realize that's kind of a fuzzy definition, but you think of a name, and that's a characteristic. A department, yeah, there's a separate entity for department. That's a separate thing, all right? A lot of times when you go in and you here in discussion, the person, places, and things, whether they be actual things or, or, or just conceptual things, those are going to be the, the, the entities in your, in your application. 
questions about this? Yes. I'm back on the indexes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm wondering when we used in access making uh, making it an index to say that it was unique. Mm -hmm. Is that just kind of a trick with access? No. Or is that? That, that, is that, is that, aren't there other ways to put constraints in? I mean, like with the SQL statements or something, you put constraints when you're creating a table? I don't, I, I don't really remember, but I'm just... Um, the bottom line is, near as I know, which again, no PhD here, but near as I know, Interface-wise, there might be a way to say that it's unique. But behind the scenes, it's going to do it by creating a unique index. All right. I, I, I can't think of any case where, because otherwise, how would it know that it's unique? You know, If you think about it, like, again, the, the, the uniqueness of an index, again, is something that is defined on this level. All right, which again, so then every application is subject to that constraint. And so let's say I wanted to add a new employee, and I want to add them with a duplicate social security number. If there wasn't an index to jump to and say, does that social security number exist, what would the database have to do? It would have to scan through every employee to see if their social security number is there. And that doesn't like ring true. It doesn't like make sense. You can imagine a giant application, you know, Amazon, you know, registering for a new account, putting in an email address, right? That is, I'm sure, some kind of key or index or something like that. And it's definitely constrained to be unique. You can't have two people with the same email address logging into Amazon, all right? So if you think about it, I go in and I'm, a, I'm trying to enter a new customer. But I put in, you know, maybe by transposing letters or something, the same email address as someone existing. Can you imagine all the customers Amazon has to do a query that would scan through all of those looking for it? Again, who knows how long that would take in like real time, but in computer time, that would be an eternity. You know, much better to have an index that you could jump to and say, yep, this person already exists. All right. So interface wise, yeah, you can you can probably do it. Um, if you if you're talking about using the SQL create statements, um, I'd have to brush up on those. But I think as part of the create statement, you create an index. Uh, but I, I rarely, I'll confess, I rarely have used those SQL statements to actually create a table. Um, I typically do it through some kind of interface. But again, I would think that if you identify uh, something as being unique, it would make, make an index for it behind the scenes. Other questions? All right. Here's what I want to do. I want to go through and sort of repeat what we did towards the end of class last time. Wasn't it raining heavy again last time? It's like, is this class like the, the rain class? I, did, I just remember like looking out and I remember like, didn't I look out the window last time to see how hard it was raining? All right, so let's go and let's repeat what we did last time. Here's our database. I don't know if I'm coming down with something or not, but I feel a little short of breath today. It's like, if you notice me sighing, I'm not exasperated. I'm just trying to <laughs> catch a breath. All right. 
let's go in here and let's create a empty database application. See, we're living it up. Last time we created one and used the pre-built in stuff. So let's go and create this. Take a few minutes to relax and listen to the gentle <laughs> falling of rain as it tears through the roof <laughs> above my head and starts dumping water properly. <laughs> create an empty website, put it on the desktop, oh, it's a baby. thank you, I don't know if I've taught long enough to say I was doing that just to see if you're paying attention. What do you think? It works. Yeah. And I will call this HR Empty because this will be our same database but starting out uh, with an empty website. So I'll click OK. Do I want to create it? I sure do. And here we go. All right, so we don't have anything in there, right, but the web config file. Now, here's our database, all right, from before. I want to move that into my application's directory structure somewhere, all right? But I don't want to move it right into the, the, the application's root directory. Does anyone recall where I want to put the data? The special folder for app data. database, app data, right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an app data folder. And I'm going to move this guy in there. Then I'll hit refresh so it knows about it. Okay, so now it knows about my database. So now I'm ready to build some pages. So I'll go in and I will create new file web form. Again, I'm skipping the parts that we already know, right? Because if you were actually doing an application, you'd probably define your master pages first and your CSS and all that. But I'm fast forwarding to actually building one of the pages. So I'll go and click Add. And here's my code. There and I'll pin it down. I can go and I can drag into my div. I can drag my SQL data source over here. Now remember that to do this database access, 
you have two pieces of it. You have the data source that is responsible for talking to the database. Then you have the, the, the visual component or the user interface component that is responsible for sort of talking to the user, if you will. And they need to be bound together. All right? You need to bind the data to the appropriate visual source. It doesn't really matter what order you do these steps in, but it makes more sense for, for me to think of grabbing the data source first. All right. So there's the data source. Now, if I knew all the properties that I wanted to set this data source to, I could go in and just configure it right here, type in all the properties and all the stuff that I wanted. But I can't remember all those. So I'm going to cheat and go to the design view. And if I right mouse on this, I can go to configure data source. Now, keep in mind this is the very first time that I am going in to create a data source for this web application. So I need to create a connection to the database. I want to be able to reuse that connection. All right. Many applications are only going to have one database to them. Some applications may have more than one database. But if I change something about the database, like where it's located or user ID and password or any sorts of things, I want that information isolated in one place. So I only have to change it in one place. The, the, the information, the piece of information that relates to how this data source connects to the database is called the connection string. The connection string supplies the parameters that the data source needs to connect to the database. And the connection string is going to be stored in the web config file. And we'll take a look at that. Now, the important thing to remember is that we only want to have one connection string per database. All right? Because, again, if something changes about the database, we only want to change it in one place. We actually could convert the database from access to SQL Server without having changing any of the code other than changing the connection string. Because the connection string that's really the only place where the information about how you connect to the database should live. So, <clears throat> because I put everything in app data, this drop down has got the name of my database. So I'm going to select it. That's all it's going to have. It's not going to have, at this point, any existing connections because this is the very first time that we're, going, we're, we're doing this. So, I pick the database, I click next. What do I want to save the connection string as? And I'll call it HR database. Now, it's connected to that because it knows the tables that are involved, right? And so I'm going to say I want to see a listing of all employees. And for now, I'm going to take the easy way and simply say I want to see all the information about all employees. <coughs> we'll talk more about some of these other options, but right now we'll take that. I can click Next. I can test the query to see that it works. And I can click Finish. And now I have this data source that hooks to the right database and pulls the appropriate employee information that I'm interested in. But that's all it does. It doesn't show the data. All right. To show the data, I have to pick some user interface element or some visual element. And I will pick the grid view. 